Yeah, that's what I'm doing these days. I just randomly call people. Pocket dial. That's what I do for fun. We up? Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So welcome back, Kat. We got a real life superhero in our midst. You know, it's amazing, but... Um, my dear friend Kat, who I think is going to be getting initiated in the next month or so, um, I guess it's been about, what, eight, nine years, something like that. And so he was in his early 20s. And Kat always had a dream of joining the military. But he was thinking the Coast Guard, which is, they're disparagingly referred to by other branches of the military, puddle jumpers. But, I mean, the, the Coast Guard's a branch of the military. Most people aren't aware of that, but in addition to the Army and the Navy and the Air Force, um, I believe the Marines are a branch of the Navy, if I'm not mistaken. Then there's also the Coast Guard, a fourth branch of the government that takes care of, the, you know, obviously takes care of the coastal waters or, uh, that, you know, are on either side of our country. Um, and, uh, but it was going to make him have to travel. He's going to travel a lot and go move somewhere else. And he and his wife just decided that, you know what, we don't want to be so far away from the temple. It's just not worth it to us. So even though I have, he had a great opportunity, it was the right time, and uh, you know, he's like a fish in the water, he could easily qualify for you know, all the requirements and was a lifeguard previously and so on and so forth, even though it would have worked for him really well to be a member of the Coast Guard, and, uh, and it was a great opportunity there for him. He, he decided not to pursue it. Specifically because he and his wife wanted to stay close to the temple and be able to regularly associate with and the devotees and serve the deities and, and be a part of the community. Um, I, I think it was good, you know, good for them, <clears throat> but also it was good for us. So they, they made that austerity, they made that austere decision to not pursue what well, was almost like a childhood dream of yours, really. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, then somehow or other he went and became a fireman. Now most firemen who live in cities, generally they end up acting almost as EMTs. Kind of like they, they end up, you know, somebody falls, hurts themselves, or, 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 um, there's some kind, yeah, they end up performing the work of, a, of an emergency medical technician, a paramedic, something like that. They don't necessarily do much in terms of structural fires because fire suppression systems are so good. It used to be, you know, 100 years ago, fire, the fire department was privatized. Most people who you know, don't study history don't know this. Anyway, everything was built out of wood, A. So our whole country was built out of wood, the cities. Um, not necessarily, you know, stone construction was an older thing, but the, the big cities came up quick, came up out of wood. And then there was no fire suppression system. And there also wasn't indoor plumbing, so there wasn't even water available all over the place. And then, you know, and people would burn kerosene. First it was whale oil, and then that got replaced by kerosene um, because of the efforts of uh, Rockefeller and Standard Oil. And they, they made kerosene cheap, and they replaced the uh, dwindling supply of whale oil from the incredible amount of whaling and, and harvesting of whale blubber to get oil from their fat to, you know, to burn and light homes. It was very expensive. Only the rich could afford to light their homes. Why everybody went to sleep when the sun went down because it was just pitch black and there was nothing to do. So anyway, people were lighting their homes with kerosene and then, you know, you got open flames and so and then you got wood houses and you don't lack running water and there's no fire suppression system, and there's no fire department, and one building lights another building, lights another building, lights another building, and you end up with this, yeah, this massive conflagration, and entire city blocks are disappearing in a matter of minutes. 
So they had these fire departments that you had to pay, and if you didn't pay, they'd let your house burn. They'd deal with the house next to yours that did pay, and they'd let your house burn. And so that, that gradually led to having, and same, actually the police had a s similar problems, it was kind of a privatized thing as well. And then these things became, um, the police have a little bit more of a sordid history because they were involved in enforcing Jim Crow laws in the South, some of the first police forces in the country. But anyway, with fire departments, they then, you know, they made them municipal departments, they, they became government departments, and they exist so that you don't get this structure, 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 structure burning. They just, they're fast. They're right on it. But I mean, how many fires do you see happening in your city? Like where you live, how many fires do you see happening? They don't happen. Why? Because fire departments are really good at their job. It used to be a problem, but they organize. Now there's fire departments all over our country, and they mainly sit around and, you know, whatever, dance on their pole and, and uh, you know, clean their fire trucks and work out and make good meals and hang out. At least that's what most of the sitcoms that deal with fire departments look like. And, you know, in actuality, they end up doing the work of EMTs because they, they, that way they have some utility and they become a, like a city version of, a, you know, of, a, of a, um, an ambulance service. Um, and, they're, and they're highly trained. And then when, then when fires occur, but probably 90%, 95% of their career is spent doing this other type of work. So Cat went and joined Cal Fire. Cal Fire is a different animal. Cal Fire deals with the unincorporated areas. So sometimes there'll be a city, they'll have a fire department, but then sometimes there's cities that are small enough where they don't have their own fire department, and Cal Fire jumps in. And so then, and then they also take care of all of the chaparral brushland, which is all over Southern California. Um, there's a federal depart fire department called the Hot Shots because they're shot into the hottest part of the fire. And they, they, they directly engage with the front line of the fire. And so, uh, in areas that, you know, BLM land, Bureau of Land Management land, federal land, they'll deal with those areas. And their interagency department, their interagency crews, they work over a wide territory, crossing state lines, wherever they're needed, and they get, they get uh, rented to local municipalities or, or states as needed, and they become this n national interagency federalized fire crew. But in California, where we have, you know, fire season, we have our own Cal Fire team in addition to these guys. And the Cal Fire guys work the entire fire season. Cat just got done working 30 days straight. No break. And they sent up to Northern California to work on the Dixie Fire, which is the third largest fire in the, uh, in the history of California as of this morning, because it, it raged yesterday. Yeah, it burned up whatever it was, some massive amount of land, 110 miles or something like that in one night. Uh, <coughs> anyway, the Dixie Fire happened, and he went and was on the front line. And um, he's a tier one fire crew, and I think he's gonna end up joining the Hell Attack crew, which is the California's equivalent of smoke jumpers. Um, which I had a, like a short-lived fantasy of becoming a smoke jumper. I took fire science classes in college and was planning to go and try out. It was in training to go and try out. It's like when I was 17, that was my dream, to go to Montana, to Missoula, and go to the Smoke Jumper Academy there. And I was like prepping for that, both in terms of physical training as well as in taking courses. And then I joined the Hare Krishnas instead. Um, so he, he's become a, a tier one, and then probably out of the you know, thousands and thousands of tier one firefighters that work for Cal Fire. And these guys don't do any EMT work for all intents and purposes. They are out fighting forest fires practically every single day for five or six months a year. It's, it's like if you had that superhero dream of becoming a fireman and you had this image in your mind of what you would be doing, those guys are doing that. And so anyway, they, they call him Captain Cat because 
he, he's got a small crew, and then he's in charge of the guys in his crew under the actual captain. So they pick one guy to represent that crew and work directly under like a protege for the captain. He was chosen to be that person. He managed to save a fire truck from burning up, save several houses from burning like, single-handedly, like rushed into a burning building and like ripped down the drapes which had caught fire and like turned on a garden hose because they were out of water and like and 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 and, 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 and um, um, hosed down the eaves, the rafters that had caught fire while you know a, while a car burned in the driveway and he inhaled carbon monoxide and then drove a truck you know th- through uh, falling boulders the size of refrigerators and that had to be cleared out of the way by a, a snowmobile with one of those big things on it so that they could get out, a snowplow, so they could get out because there was no path of egress. And, you know, it was in situations where three or f- of their four paths of egress were burned up and they had to, you know, just re- like, like the guys he was with were like, in 20 years, we've never had it get this hairy. And he was in those circumstances, just got off 30, 30 days straight practically of working in those circumstances. And, and making really good moves, using his instincts, using his training, and, uh, and directly engaging one of the biggest fires in the history of California. So we couldn't be prouder of you. I feel vicariously like my childhood dream is fulfilled through you. And I feel satisfied. If there's any, I, don't, I don't regret joining the Hare Krishnas over becoming a smoke jumper in Montana, which would have been a nightmare. Oh, he's, and he's probably going to join the Helitat crew, which is guys who fly in on Black Hawk helicopters to fight fires. Smoke jumpers jump out of airplanes at low altitude and then parachute in to remote areas that you can't access through roads and then cut fire breaks and the like to stop very, very remote forest fires from becoming just out of control disasters, natural disasters. You know, like lightning will go down. And, and there's no way to get out there to fight the fire, so they jump in. And so that's the smoke jumpers. They jump in through the smoke. That's the name. So then, you know, then the hot shot crews, they all have these great names. Hot shots, smoke jumpers, it's great names. It's like the coolest names ever. Um, um, you know, it's like if you, like, you meet, like, cool gang members, it's like, that's Dice, that's Bones, that's Smokey, you know what I mean? That's Loco, that's like, you know, everybody's got like a cool name, like they all pick the iconic names, you know? And then if you go to every gang, they'll have guys with those names. There's like a list of like 50 cool names, and every gang has people with those cool names. <laughs> so the Hot Shots and the Smoke Jumpers, but then there's Hell Attack. So Hell Attack, which are guys who attack fires from helicopters and they fly in on Blackhawks because California's cool like that and then they land and they fight fires in California in remote areas you can't get to. It's California's equivalent of smoke jumpers and out of, you know, whatever it is, 5,000 firemen in the state or, you know, whatever it is, 10, 10,000. There's 5,000 firefighters just on the There's 5,000 firefighters on the Dixie Fire. There must be tens of thousands of firefighters. Maybe there's 50 or 100 guys who are on the hell attack. And it just so happens that the captain that Cat works with is a captain of the hell attack crew. And because Cat is like, there's like three guys in his crew. One of them was going to be a professional hockey player. The other one was going to join the Green Berets, but his mom convinced him not to. And then there's Cat, these three guys who can run a marathon with a 60 pound pack on their back and, you know, work chainsaw and do everything else and hop on one foot, you know, 100 miles and like all this crazy stuff they have to do because it's serious physical labor, then he's been slated to join this Hell Attack crew. And he'll finish his season out, get into his next season, and probably be a Hell Attack fireman. I mean, the name is just, it's the best name of all, right? It's like Smoke Jumper, super cool. Hot Shot, a little cooler, but the job isn't actually cooler. Hell Attack, best job of all. Right? And, like, they're doing the cool, it's the best job of all, and the coolest name. It's like a, it's like a double win. So, um, and he was back for, I guess, four days. You go back on tomorrow, right? Yeah. So I, 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 I figured that. 
So he did, you know, 24 days straight up at the Dixie Fire after doing a week down here, 30 days straight on, mandatory employment. They can't not work. And of course, they get paid time and a half, double time, whatever. So you make money 24 hours a day. It ends up being really good money. But, um, but then he went up there and did 24 days up there and they pulled him off, brought in another crew to replace him. But that Dixie Fire kicked off again in a monstrous way. And so he'll probably have to end up driving back up there again and, and working on the front lines in Northern California. Where is it, near Chico? Yeah, yeah, it's pushing up towards, moving into like Tahoe direction. Okay, it's right on the border there in Nevada. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's up near Sacramento and Tahoe. Got it. In yeah, Greensville, or whatever that town was, burned down. Yeah. The whole downtown, everything got wiped out. It's crazy. So he's probably ended up going back up there just because of necessity. And obviously, he's missing Varungi, and she's missing him. Um, but he's also getting to fulfill a dream. Anyway, the the point of the story. I mean, it's just a cool story, and I want to honor Cat and glorify him and appreciate him. But and. Uh, He got it like he, he chose Krishna instead of becoming a Coast Guard. And now he's ended up getting to do something infinitely cooler than the Coast Guard and way cooler than being a pole jumper. I mean, no, no offense. I think the Coast Guard's great and those guys are heroes too. But he's getting to do something really cool. And even within that cool profession, he gets to work for Cal Fire. And then within that cool profession where he gets to fight, actually fight fires all day, it looks like he's joined the Hell Attack crew. And it's like everything he ever could have wanted. And I'm, I'm just, you know, as I, as I kind of empathize with you and, and identify with you and appreciate you um, and talk to Varangi and, and, you know, and just also just kind of meditate on you and wish you well up there. Um, I kept thinking, you know, you must miss your wife like anything. It's hard work. It's a little scary. Sometimes it gets kind of hairy and dangerous. And then at the same time, you're like, this is my dream come true. This is something that I'm going to get to tell my grandkids about. This is like the greatest thing I ever could have done. I'm so happy. This was worth it. I can't believe I got to do this. This is my dream job and then some, and it's better than I ever could have expected. The stuff I'm already doing my first few months in is better than I ever could have expected. I'm so glad I didn't get hired on by the OCFA. I'm so glad I did a season with Cal Fire going to open up unlimited doors. And these guys, these Cal Fire Tier 1 crews, these hotshot crews that work for the state of California, they're coveted. Because a city crew is going to have you know, 5% of the experience fighting fires he has. And wildland fires, which, you know, there's, 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 there's wildland in every city. I mean, maybe not like, you know, maybe not, I mean, Laguna Beach certainly has it. Irvine has it, for sure. Maybe Huntington Beach doesn't have it. Maybe Costa Mesa doesn't have it. You know, Santa Ana probably has. It. Like, there's like, they, they all have some, you know, wildland areas and remote rural areas. And those, those, those firefighters who work structural fires for the city, they don't know how to fight them. And so uh, if he ever did want to get hired on by OCFA or by a municipal fire department in the Orange County area and, and work close to their home, he could do that because with, with the amount of experience he has, and the credentials he's getting, learn how to work a chainsaw, learn how to do all this stuff, um, like real high-level stuff, you know, you know, water rescues, <laughs> cliff rescues, they call what, low-angle rescues? Low-high-angle rescues, water rescues, being on a chainsaw crew, being a sawman, which is also like a super cool name. They call him right, Salmon, right? Yeah. So it's a super cool, like, and it's all these cool stuff. But he gets to do all this, and if he ever did want to work for a city fire department, he could. But it looks like the direction he's going to be going to this Hell Attack crew, which is, I mean, you are the special forces of the fire department. You're, you've actually, that's, that's the, I mean, you're in Black Hawk helicopters, and, you're the, and he's already gotten to ride in the fires on helicopters. He's already gotten to do it. And his lean, sinewy frame, we're always giving him a hard time because he's not packing off muscle. 
ends up actually working real well because 110 degrees out there and you got to be nimble and you got to be able to pivot and run, jump and play. And so being, having that marathon runner physique is, is the win. That long stride, right? The long stride from the tallness and the, and the, you know, the slightly underweight, you know what I mean? That marathon runner, 15% below what your optimal body weight should be on a BMI that ends up being your friend. Yeah. So anyway, that's a little bit appreciating, appreciating uh, Kat. And then I'll probably do something real cool like working in the class and show you how the verses talk about it. But I guess the main point I want to make, just at the risk of repeating myself, is that he chose Krishna and he ended up getting everything he wanted and more. Because that's how it works. That's how it works. You, you, you live with integrity. You follow your vows. You keep your commitments. You have some honor. You have some dignity. You be high class. And Krishna will fulfill all your dreams in a better way than you ever could have. And you'll end up you know, what's the, is it be more? What's that, you know? What's the, be more than you can be? There's some, some kind of army slogan. What is it? Be all, be all you can be. You end up being all you can be. Krishna reads it like that. You end up being all you can be. More than you thought you could be. You end up being all you can be and more than you were planning to be and more than you thought you could be. You just got to learn to have a little bit of trust. You're going to learn how to do your part. Krishna's not the X factor. You are. Krishna's a constant. He's not going to fail you. It's always us who are blowing it and messing things up. We think, oh, I hope Krishna's there for me. But he's always there for you. You're the one who's not there. You're the X factor. You're the variable. You're the one you can't count on. Krishna's solid as a rock. All right. So... We, we did, you know, we've actually answered all six questions from the 13th chapter. Chaitra, the body. Place, which philosophically means the body. Chaitra, gya, the knower of the place. That's the soul. Then there's Krishna, who's the knower of all bodies. Sarva Chaitrani. And so he knows all bodies. He's omniscient. He's been distinguished from us. We're both conscious beings but Krishna's omni-conscious, omniscient. And we learn what knowledge is. Knowledge, simply put, is knowing the difference between the soul and the body. A more complex understanding of knowledge is knowledge is a lifestyle that results in knowledge adhering to you, inhering within you, becoming revealed to you. And so there's a lifestyle of humility, tolerance, passion, complacence, placing importance on self-realization, finding a mentor, etc., etc. And that lifestyle results in knowledge. And then we learn what is gyam. Gyam is what's worthy of studying. And what's worthy of studying? Brahman, the highest topic. And then we learn, and then we, we, we find out that who understands these things? Mud bhakta. My devotees understand these things. My devotees understand these things. And then we learn what Purusha and Prakriti is. Purusha is the individual soul. Prakriti is the entire material world. Purusha is injected within Prakriti. And by Purusha's misuse of its free will, we enjoy and suffer in this world. And are born in good and bad wombs. And, you know, our karma manifests. But there's another Purusha, a Purusha para. There's a supreme uh, uh, Purusha who's Upadrashta Anumanta, who's the overseer and the permitter. And that Purusha, Para, he's Avyaya, Ishwara, he's inexhaustibly the Lord. And so, just like there's two knowers, one of them's omniscient, there's also two Purushas us, and then the Supreme Purusha, who's known as Paramatma, the Supreme Soul. And so Krishna answers all the questions. 
all six questions that Arjuna asked at the beginning of the chapter. And then he's going to wrap up the chapter. And he wraps up the chapter by saying, we'll do text 24 one more time. One who understands this philosophy concerning material nature, Prakriti, the living entity, Purusha, and the interactions of the modes of nature, the gunas, is sure to attain liberation. It says he, he doesn't he's not born again. Nasabuya Abhijayate. Abhijayate means he is born. Nabuya, he is not born again. Sa, that person, he is not born again. Who what? Who understands Purusha Prakriti and their interaction? He'll never take his birth here, regardless of his present position. So there you go. So this, you know, understanding these basics of theology um, is, is powerful. Know the truth for it shall set you free. There's that idea, you know? It's actually a quote from the Bible. Um, I think. I gotta Google it. My memory's failing me a bit. My eyesight's failing me too. But I think it's a quote from the Bible. Oh, let's find out. Sorry. I'm just going to do it because it's bugging me. I think it might be a paraphrase from King James. Tell them it's over. Tell them to come inside. Yep. Yeah, it's from King James. Ha ha! <laughs> Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's a paraphrase. I told you. It's from the King James Bible. Um, John 8, 32. It's actually, you find that it's, it's inscribed on a bunch of places. I think it's on the like CIA headquarters in Langley. It's at Georgetown University. It's at a bunch of universities. Um, yeah, just sit on down. Good to have you in class, son. Um, so, yeah, there's this idea that knowledge is powerful and knowledge helps you. If you know the right thing, that, that knowledge helps you to move in such a way where you'll become successful and you'll become liberated. Okay, so then the next verse is, some people, some perceive the super soul within themselves through meditation, others through the cultivation of knowledge, and still others through working without fruitive results. So, dhyane natmana, dhyane natmana pashanti, they see the atma, by meditation. Some, they see the Atma, the Self, Dhyanena, Dhyan, Dhyanena, by Dhyan. Pashanti, they see, what do they see? Atma. Others through the cultivation of knowledge. Kechit Atmana, Atmana. And some, <coughs> Some see the self by the self. <laughs> uh, some see the self by the self. Some see the self by the self. Okay, now here we go. Some see the self by the self by meditating on the self. I, 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 I missed the word. Atmani. Some see the self by the self by meditating on the self. What does that mean? I don't know. It's anybody's guess. 
Krishna likes to do this with the word atma. Atmani atmanam atmana by the self, in the self, the self. <laughs> you follow? He does this. So then you got to decide how you want to interpret the, ter- the word atma. So usually it's like some by meditating on the self with the mind are able to discover the true self. You see how you got you to some by meditating on on their spiritual essence with their mind or intelligence are able to then discover their true self. Something like that. And dhyanena by meditation indicates like something about what he means. Verses like this inspire a little bit of uh, interpretation. But, you know, they're bookended by the entire chapter we just read. So it's not a free-for-all. Because obviously, Krishna says, if you know this, you'll achieve liberation. And some people are able to do it by this, and some by this, and some by that. But what are they able to understand? Purusha and Prakriti, Yanam, Gyeam, and, and uh, uh, um, Chaitra and Chaitra, yeah. Does that make sense? So you can't just, it's not an absolute free-for-all. And so after, you know, a full chapter of 24 verses, you can then give a little bit. You can give a little bit here. And... Uh, a little bit of room and have an enigmatic Upanishadic verse and people aren't going to go off the deep end. But literally it's like by meditation on the self they see some people the self with the self by the self. (laughs) And so Prabhupada's translation is nice. Some perceive the super soul. So he's saying now the atma that they're perceiving is the super soul. You see that? within themselves, there's in the self, through meditation, by meditation. And it seems like he skips the word with the self. So fair enough. Others through the cultivation of knowledge. Anye sankyena yogena karma yogena cha apare. Apare. Some people. Anye. Others. So twice he uses this word. Anye Sankhyena, yogena, by Sankhya yoga. Karma yogena, by karma yoga. Cha apade, and also others. So there's three options here. You can see the self in the self, by the self, through meditation. You also might be able to... No. No, because there's only one object. Anyway... So there's three things. You see the self in the self, by the self, through meditation, or you see it through Sankhya Yoga, or you see it through Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga, of course, is renouncing the fruits of your action. Sankhya Yoga is through the cultivation of knowledge. And then Dhyanena is by meditation. And so Krishna's acknowledging different recommended spiritual technologies in the Vedic literatures and explaining how all of these things can teach you about Purusha and Prakriti and help you achieve knowledge. You get it? So he said, you know, here's the knowledge and if you achieve this, then you, you're learned. But then you might mean, well, like what, you know, practically speaking am I supposed to do? Do I just read these verses over and over and over again? Or do I just, you know, memorize these words? Or do I just read it once and it's good enough? And now he's saying, no, there's a course here for how you recognize it. And the Sankhya Yoga might be you're reading it over and over again and studying. That, that, you know, that's, that's, that's that method. And so Krishna's acknowledging here different standardly recommended modalities that are used as a course of spiritual practice in order to galvanize the knowledge he just expressed in you. Does that make sense? Like I was just talking to a young man today who wants to practice chastity. He wants to practice chastity. And so we spent some time talking about the value of chastity. I you know, we spent 20 minutes talking about the value of chastity, the value of self-control. 
the value of not being a victim of your senses. The value of not being promiscuous, the value of not masturbating. We spent a good amount of time talking about the value of being self-controlled and chaste and not addicted to, essentially, to sex. That's what chastity means. It means to be celibate. It's a fancy way or a a euphemistic way of, of saying celibate. And so we spent some time, we spent a good 20 minutes talking about the value of celibacy, the value of self-control. And then we spent a good 20 minutes talking about practical techniques for being celibate. How long it takes to break a habit, how long it takes to bump the hump, Um, some practical tools to get from point A to point B, having a group of friends, cold showers, exercise, figuring out what it is you're trying to avoid, what's made you angry, what's made you frustrated, what's disturbing you that you can't deal with that makes you want to go and release a bunch of neurotransmitters to stupefy yourself. We have drugs within us. And there's things people do to release those drugs. And so why do you want to release a drug within yourself? What are you trying to run away from? What are you trying to numb yourself from? And then teaching them how to go and look at that thing that you're trying to avoid and how that's a magic pill for um, nipping addictive behaviors in the bud because you remove their fuel. It's like removing the fuel for a fire. It's like when you start a counter blaze. A lot of what they do is start fires in the fire department. There's a fire coming. It's raging towards them. So then they will cut a fire break. You know, a 30-foot wide? Sometimes, yeah. No, no, yeah. Those are five blades wide, probably. So, and how big is the blade? About 10, yeah, about 10 feet. So, a f- 10 foot wide? No, like 50 Oh, 50 foot wide. They'll cut a 50 foot wide fire break. Fire's raging towards them. Then they start the fire. And then the fire burns towards the fire that's coming towards them. And then it meets there instead of meeting right at them. And then it kills the fire there because there's no more fuel because they burned it from this side. And then it can't jump over the 50 feet to get to the new stuff. And if it does, then they're there to put that little stuff out before it can start the blaze. But it takes the intensity out of the fire. Because when the fire gets going real intense, it just creates this um, almost like a chain reaction where it's just like there's so much heat, it becomes almost like a tidal wave. And so this is the way they stop it. And so it's a way of removing the fuel. If you remove the thing you're running from away, then there's no need to engage in a coping behavior because you've actually addressed the very thing you want to run away from. Do you guys follow this? I could get into like a lot of detail, but I'm just like, I want to sort of keep it, keep it G-rated for everybody because we're online and what have you. But we spent time discussing the theory and the value of chastity, and then we spent a bunch of time giving him some practical tools And, like, and like he took notes. Like I gave him, like it's like a sheet. Like here's your notes. Here's how it's going to work. Let me tell you how it's going to. And I even like modeled it for him. Like not like like modeled for him by. I don't know, it's probably the wrong word, but I, I walked him through what he would experience and and how to stay chaste, how to, how to win. And. Uh, and then, you know, also, you know, if, if he has a problem, you know, it's okay. And, you know, we're, we're looking at, at uh, you know, the end of the year, having resolved this issue once and for all for him. And it takes a, a few months to get our, our, our uh, the training wheels off. and takes a few months to get his sea legs and get into shape with this. That's okay. So anyway, I troubleshot it from a number of angles. And really, the, the, the advice for addictive behaviors are largely the same. You learn the specifics of each particular addiction, but the, the core of it's really the same. Um, 
And so you see Krishna also, oh, it's a little bit of the same type of thing here. There's a theory, there's an idea, and then there's different methodologies which can be used either individually or collectively in order to help you accomplish that goal. Like, there's where we want to go, here's why it's worth going there, and here's how we're going to get there. Let's talk about where we're going. Let's talk about why it's worth going there. And let's talk about how difficult it's going to be to get there. And now let's look at some real tools that you can use to help you get from point A to point B. And so as Krishna makes mention of these modalities, of these technologies, of these spiritual disciplines which were recommended in various Vedic texts, he's letting you know, yeah, the same type of stuff that we've talked about throughout the Gita, the same type of, of uh, 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 um, uh, protocol is useful for learning this. Did you guys follow that? Again, there are those who, although not conversant in spiritual knowledge, begin to worship the Supreme Person upon hearing about him from others. Because of their tendency to hear from authorities, they also transcend the path of birth and death. So that's kind of cool. So this is another group. Anye, again, others. Two Anye, but others. A nam. God, I'm just dying here. Evam ajananta. Shrutva. Shrutva anyeba upasate. All right, so. Shutva anyebhya. After hearing from others, they, they worship. He worships. There are other people who begin to worship after hearing from others, even though they're ajananta. They don't know. They don't know. They're ignorant. But they hear from other people, and that's enough to inspire them and give them faith, and they begin the practice. Teyapi. Teyapi cha atit anti eva mrityum shruti parayana because of their dedication to hearing, because of their dedication to hearing, they also transcend death. Wild, right? So there's these like yogis who sacrifice the fruits of their labor and study and meditate. And then there's people like all of us who lack good karma genes who were born in the family of meat eaters who were raised with low class religion who got addicted to sinful behavior like our sinfully behaved parents and therefore we don't necessarily have a ton of qualification to be, to be practicing really high level levels of self-control and focus. And so there's a protocol for those people too. <laughs> you find someone who is further along on the path than yourself and you, you dedicate yourself to hearing from them and on the strength of that wisdom which is bequeathed to you or injected into you. Like when you take second initiation in the Hare Krishna movement, your guru chants the mantra in your right ear. He's like injecting the wisdom within you. It's like a tantric thing. Actually, sometimes in tantric traditions, and forgive me, I'm just, this is the actual tradition, sometimes the guru will spit in your ear. And spitting in your ear is a ritual. Can you guys guess? It's like they're inseminating you. It sounds gross, I know, I'm sorry, but it's like, you know, you know, most old world cultures, you know, it's like, hey, there's a phallic symbol, and 
You know what I mean? And there's a, there's a, there's a vaginal symbol, and like, it's, everybody's just cool with it. And it's like no big deal, and nobody freaks out. And it's like, it's all okay. And the human body wasn't detestable, and it wasn't Victorian. It's kind of like a Victorian thing. It's a Muslim Victorian thing. If you look at ancient Indian sculpture and, and architecture pre Mogul period, you find there's like it's 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 fairly celebratory of the human body. Anyway, um, yeah, the guru is injecting, inseminating knowledge in these tantric traditions. We don't do that, but the guru does chant the mantras in your right ear, which is injecting that wisdom into you. You follow? And so this is it's like. You don't have the qualifications yourself, but you learn to be respectful and hear from your elders and their wisdom takes birth in you. And then you end up following in their footsteps. And that's your good fortune. If I was to interpret these two verses... I would say, and then by the grace of those people, you're able to engage in some of these things. Do you follow? Because it does say upasate. So it does mean they're doing some form of worship. Now you could say you take the deity worship, and it could be a, a nod to think, something like deity worship, but of course deity worship also involves study and also involves dedication of the fruits because you have to give all sorts of things to the deities, and you also meditate. And so these other modalities at least overlap with ritual temple worship. Upasate means worship. So if you want to see this as a fourth option, at least it overlaps with the other options. Alternatively, um, you know, you could see it as uh, you could see it as leading to those other three. I just, you know, this like the four yogas thing, Raja Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga, from the book Raja Yoga by Vivekananda, the four yogas that he introduces a hundred years ago that you know is not from the Vedas that is taught in most low-level college classes. This is actually in some ways an early source for that. He doesn't quote this, but it, he should have. Would have given me more respect for him. Dhyanena, that's the Raja Yoga, the meditation. Sankhya Yogena, that's your Jnana. And then Karma Yogena, there's your Karma. And then Upasate is your Bhakti. I'd never noticed that before, but I like it. Nobody else ever noticed it. I've been ripping on Vivekananda and Raja Yoga in college classes to professors for decades now, and nobody's ever said anything. They've all hung their heads in shame. But this would be a great rebuttal to my position. <laughs> um, anyway, the reality is there's a lot of overlap between these positions. And so how can you give up the fruits if you haven't studied to know that you should give up the fruits? And if you study, then you're going to learn that you should give up the fruits. And if you study, then your study becomes a form of meditation. And if you do karma yoga, you eventually qualify yourself to meditate. So either these things exist in a hierarchy where one thing leads to another. Karma yoga leads to jnana yoga, leads to bhakti yoga. Krishna invokes a, a hierarchy like that in the 18th chapter and in the 6th chapter. It's two places he does that. Alternatively, they're all done together and there's many verses where Krishna talks about doing all of them together at the same time. Alternatively, you might do one and it overlaps with others. Not necessarily in a hierarchical fashion, but just out of necessity. You, and you end up kind of like, you know, eventually moving in between them or doing all of them. So you can start with one and do all of them. Start with all of them. Work through one up a hierarchy. There's different models. and some, I think all those models are actually supported in the Gita. But there's this pre-existing group of technologies which are useful to people who want to overcome materialism and tread the spiritual path. And so Krishna makes mention of them repeatedly. And as he's dealing with this Upanishadic wisdom and these six topics, 
they show up again. And every time he, he goes over them, he does a little, adds a little bell or whistle and gives you a little something extra. So you could, if you wanted to, I've never seen it done, but it would make a great you know, master's thesis or even a PhD dissertation. You could take a look at all the different types of yoga that Krishna recommends it throughout the Gita, and you could then compare and contrast every single instance where Krishna does so, and you know, show what unique things come up in each section, and what things are repetitive, and when it's a hierarchy, when it's overlapping, when it's doing them all at once. You follow? When it's you move from one to another, but not necessarily in a hierarchy, when it's different options for different you know, personality types. You could, you, could, you could go over this, and you could actually look at the dozens of instances in the Gita where Krishna speaks verses like this, that we've already surveyed dozens of instances just at this point in the 13th chapter, where Krishna's done this, different sections where he's talked about these spiritual technologies. And, you know, it would actually make a really good uh, dissertation. Make an excellent dissertation. So, one of the, one, one of the things that's far out here is this idea that, you know, you, you're, you're devoted to hearing. Shruti parayana. You're devoted to what's heard. You're devoted to hearing. You're devoted to that, to, to the people who, who you hear from, who are anabya, from others. Having heard from them. And ostensibly, obviously, those others are learned and have acquired. Uh, expertise in the fields that you are incapable of engaging in on your own and by their inspiration you're able to then either begin a fourth process which is worship or you're able to liaise with the other processes with their good guidance know that whatever is that you see in existence both the moving and the non-moving what's non-moving trees What's moving? Animals. What's not moving? Matter. Not moving is matter. What's moving? Spirit. You follow? So moving, not moving. Some form of locomotion is there in all living entities, even plants, even clams. You know, even like oysters, stuff like that. They still open and close and grab stuff and do something. They have some locomotion. Even if they're not able to actually move from point A to point B, they at least have some locomotion. Even cells are swimming around doing stuff. You follow? So moving and non-moving. There's a few different ways you can break it up, but it's essentially trying to, it's a way of trying to refer to everything which is in existence. Is only a combination of Chaitra and Chaitragya. You follow? That's interesting because that would indicate, I mean, number one, if it was all life, then you could say it was just Chaitra and Chaitragya. But otherwise, it almost makes Chaitra and Chaitragya synonymous with Purusha and Prakriti. Yavat Sama Yeah, I'm going to have to start using light, man. It's just ridiculous. Yavat sanjayate kinchit. Whatever, anything that exists, that is born. Sattvam stavara jangamam. Which exists. Sattva means exists. Whether it's stavara, uh, um, uh, stationary, or jangamam, moving. So I would probably tend to interpret this either A, it's, an, it's referring to all life, but I would probably, if it was me, I would probably interpret this more generally, that right here, Chaitra and Chaitragya are acknowledged as being synonymous with Purusha and Prakriti. 
Purushan Prakriti being the larger categories of spirit matter, Chaitra and Chaitra Gya being the microcosmic instances of that larger category in the form of a soul and a body. But here by saying that whatever exists is Chaitra and Chaitra Gya, if you interpret it broadly, then Chaitra and Chaitra Gya are acknowledged as being another way of referring to Purusha and Prakriti. Body and soul is another way of referring to an instance of the larger category, which is Purusha and Prakriti. Uh, this, again, I mentioned this last, yesterday, last week, but it's, it's, it's a synecdoche, a synecdoche, a synecdoche. Uh, um, it's a, a metonym. It's one thing being a name for another. A metonym is a, one thing being a name for another, and one particular type of metonym is a synecdoche, where an instance of something is for the larger category. And so, you know, it's like the black shirts. The black shirts is the name of the New Zealand rugby team. But they're not just, they, they wear black shirts, but they're athletes, they're human beings. But they're called black shirts, but they, you follow, or you can say, you know, Anaheim won the game. You say Anaheim won the game. The whole city of Anaheim won the game. Who won the game? The Angels, which are the baseball team of Anaheim. You get it? So if you refer to either the larger category, which is the whole city of Anaheim, but you know you mean the Angels baseball team, or you refer to the smaller thing, which is the black shirts, but you're actually referring to the people who play on the team who are wearing black shirts. And so either you say the small thing refers to the big thing, or the big thing refers to the smaller thing. Either one of those is synecdoches. Um, and so I, I see here Krishna acknowledging the similarity between four of the six categories. That he's actually, it's six things which fit into three pairs, but that two of those pairs are actually different ways of saying the same thing. I see at least an homage to that in this verse. If you wanted to describe this verse as only referring to the soul and the body, then you could say, okay, that's different than spirit matter, because matter would also include like that. But if you interpret it, um, if you interpret it to be, uh, uh, of course, that, that's a dead tree, but it's a corpse of a tree. But you would say, you know, like, like stones, for instance. Of course, stones are sometimes thought of as being conscious in Vedic culture, too. But anyway, um, <laughs> they talk about mountains giving birth and all sorts of stuff. But. Um, <coughs> if you were to interpret this as not referring to gross matter and only referring to life, then it would still maintain the three separate pairs. But if you saw this as being referring to the entire world, and I certainly think the verse supports that, the Sanskrit supports that, then it would be uh, um, shrinking down. So now we're not talking about six things anymore. We're really just talking about four things which have six names. Did you guys follow that? Did you follow what I just said? Oh my God, you're killing me. Did you follow it? Oh, I've said this so many times. Come on, guys. Don't do this to me. It's like low level. Like I feel like I repeated myself way more than I should have had to, and you're still not getting it. Chaitran Chaitra Gya is the field and the knower of the field. What's that referred to? The soul and the body. Purushan Prakriti, what's that referred to? Spirit and matter. Well, what is a soul and a body except for an instance of spirit and matter? Therefore, the soul and the body are instances of the larger category of spirit and matter. This verse says whatever is born in this world that exists on any level is simply a union of Chaitra and Chaitra Gya. So if you would take it to born being like bodies, then it would be Chaitra and Chaitra Gya. However, if you take it that born in this world, exists in this world, is, arises in this world, as referring to anything which exists, including stones and tiles, as well as life forms, then Chaitra and Chaitra Gya become synonyms for Purusha and Prakriti. And certainly, when you look at the way those two things are defined, Chaitra and Chaitra Gya, souls and bodies, and spirit and matter, it certainly seems like they're the same thing. I mean, when Chris is talking about the soul, he's talking about being born in good and bad wounds. Excuse me. When he's talking about matter, he's talking about various bodies. So it certainly seems like these terms are synonymous by how they're described, and this verse might be the one instance in the Gita where those two terms are collapsed 
into one, which is something we dealt with probably five or six times over the last few months. Tadeo, did you follow that? Yes, sir. Remember when you asked me that question a month ago, right? Right. And we, we've detailed it so many times since then, right? Correct. But here is another instance. You followed it, right? Did you guys follow that now? You're killing me. Remember, you at least need to be devoted to hearing. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I think we're good. I feel good. I feel like we covered some good information. Thank you very much, IGTV. Any feedback for me?